So I've already finished editing the video for this episode, and it's a little longer than most of the episodes I try to shoot for. I try making episodes about a single sort of section of a project, and I don't like to drag that out over multiple episodes. And I also don't like taking several episodes and jamming it all into one just to hit some mystical number of minutes. But this one is a little bit longer, and you're going to wonder why when it's just stock preparation. I mean, this is easy, right? You just parallel cut, do a little cross cut, you know, do a little happy dance, and you're done. But the problem with this project are all the angles. When I was designing this project in my head, going over how I was going to do it, it turns out that a lot of the things that you can delay till later and actually usually do much later in a project have to get pulled in all the way up into the stock preparation phase in order to be able to even accomplish the project. Now, it turns out that a lot of this sort of complicated work that we do here in the stock preparation now means that we don't have to do it later. So I think some of the other episodes are going to be a little bit on the easier side because of that. So now while you may not be planning on making some diamond shaped cabinet, I think any project that you plan that would have some compound angles in it or anything leaning, things like that, you're going to find hopefully some value in this video, some things that maybe you didn't think about in the pre-planning. So hopefully you won't get to that point where you go, oh yeah, I should have done that back when I was, yeah, that part. So with that, I won't make it longer by talking here. Let's get right to it. So after a hectic week with Domzilla in the shop, I uh, lent him the car. He's off in California making holes there to leave me alone for a bit here. So I can get back to my Angle Madness project. So this is the stock of curly maple that I've picked up. I've actually had this for a number of years. This is one of those projects where whenever I get started on it, something gets in the way. So every now and then you get a project that, that just goes like that. So this one here, we're gonna, we're gonna fight it and get through. And so this stock here actually came from two different purchases. These boards here, came from one purchase and these boards back here came from a second one and there's actually a marked difference between them. To me these ones here look fairly similar. These ones back here have a considerably different grain pattern and I think it would be too loud. So I'm not sure if I'm going to cut these and make a second unit. I may but they're going to be all from these boards will be the second unit and these boards here will be the unit that I'll be making for myself. Now for picking out the grain I actually have the mock-up boards over here so that we can lay them out. Uh, one of the ideas is going to be, I'd like to cut the parts all in a row so that you get as much as possible to have a grain continuity. Now, I know that when we do these cuts, there are going to be some pretty large areas that are missing in between because of the miters. So as you look here, you can see that, well, there'd be a large expanse here that's missing. So as far as grain continuity, well, no, it's not like you're going to see the grain wrapped. But it'll be nice that if we at least get the grain from the same neighborhood, it's going to be the same tone, it's going to probably have the same swirl action going. It'll look like it's wrapping. So that's, that's the effect that I'm going to be going for when I lay these things out. Now this piece here, this is the middle shelf actually. The top shelf is going to be located here on this board. And I didn't show it in the mock-up, but it comes up like a diamond. What I would like to do is then have the top taper back in. So it's the same cuts, it's as if you take the top portion, make a second one, and flip it and put it on the top, but it's not going to be as high, right? So just like a diamond, it'll come up and then angle in. So that's going to be on the top. That's why I want to take this narrow top and put it on a wider board. It's because I'm going to be making the cuts from the bottom of the board, and then this off cut, I'm going to be marking it so I know where the drawer stock came from so that I can use these to create the top triangle that's going to be beveling back in. So that way there I can get the grain to be continuous over that bevel that we have at the top of the cabinet. Now the cuts for that are the same angles, it's just it's exactly like taking this top piece, making a second one, flipping it upside down, but just not making it quite as wide. So I'm using this wider board for the bottom section. It has quite a bit of fairly straight looking grain from here up, so I'll be trying to take advantage of that for this bottom portion. So just the very bottom of it will have kind of a ripply effect. So now for you, it was about a minute ago in this video clip, but when, that part where I said that things always get in the way of this project ever completing, after I brought the video upstairs to import it in, I come back downstairs thinking, it still smells like we're getting rain around here today, but the sky's clear. So I started looking around and it turned out my water softener decided to just avoid the middleman and get me the water directly here in the shop. So I had a little bit of a delay. It's been about 10 days since that part of the video, but we're back at it and uh, we'll get that thing repaired this week. So I've had a chance to dimension the stock, got a straight edge on one side, parallel cut on the other. There's still plenty wide for what I need, but I need these solid reference surfaces for placing these boards on here. Now you might think, why didn't I just cut these to the right widths right off the bat? Well, the problem is that the sides of these all have different inclinations. 
The sides have a different inclination from the facets, which have a different inclination from the front and a different inclination than the back. So all of those things combine make it that these pieces, which this is from the version 2, if I stand these up, you can clearly see that they're all different heights. So you can't just lay this thing out, rip it to a width, and then just start doing the cross cuts. Each one of them has a separate rip width. Now, of course, having the mock-up makes it easy that I can put this down, I can eyeball straight down, and I'm going to know the width. But one of the catches is that if I just measured this front face, that's not actually the width of the rip because these things are inclined. So it's a little hard to see on this part, but what I'll do is I'll show you on this piece of scrap. If I have this thing vertical and I need this to be, you know, this long, well, that's the right length. But if I, if I go to tip this thing over, you can see that if I'm going to have a flat top on this, like that, we'll take a look down here. Now I've got a gap down here. The only way I could possibly make this so that I have then a flat bottom is to make this piece that I'm cutting longer by the amount that's you see uh, exposed up here, right? It's the, the opposite triangle down here. So it turns out that all of these, they end up needing to be a little bit longer by anywhere between three and six millimeters. So what I did when I did the MDF mock-up is I figured out which one needed the greatest amount extra, which is the one that has the strongest incline. The strongest inclines are the sides. So I took the extra material I needed on the sides in order to make this thing, now added an extra couple millimeters to it just to be sure, and then that's the size I ripped. So I'm going to take the mock-up pieces for the bottom and lay them out on this larger board so that you can see how the layout goes and then some of the things we have to deal with with the layout. So if I simply lay these out the way that they're going to be if we took the front and we just unfolded the front. So we take the front and we unfold the sides to flatten it all out. This is what we would get. So the reference surface that I have is what I'm seeing as the top of this board. That's where I'm going to be laying out all the miters and for the compound cuts on this board because the other side, this side down here, is all a variable diff distance from the top. I mean, one of them, the front has a certain distance down to here, whereas the sides have a greater distance down to here. So it makes it a whole lot easier to just reference off the top only and not worry about the bottom. Now, the way I'm going to mark these is I'm not going to use the boards themselves. I'm not going to line a pencil up to the edge and mark it. With the bevels that are on there, I wouldn't be very accurate. Now, if for some reason I really wanted to do that, one of the benefits of this design is that there's a symmetry to it. Each side is different, but the two sides are mirror images. So with this being the middle section uh, assembled with tape, I've done this so many times now, I'm good. You can see that all these angles here are unique. All these are different compound angles. All eight of these are unique. But these ones here are the same, except that they're basically leaning the opposite direction. So if I wanted to actually lay out these cuts by using the mock-up parts, it would be possible, as long as I take the left side and I put it on the right and the right onto the left and put them face down. Let me show you. So currently I've got the left side over here, the front, and then the right side. What I'm saying by doing the mirror image is I could take this piece and I could pick it up, flip it upside down, and place it down over here. At the same time I take this one, pick it up, flip it upside down, and put it over here. This one here gets pivoted in place by flipping it over in place. This side gets lifted up, rotated, and placed down. This one here would get rotated and placed down. Do the same with the outside facets. Now, I could actually line this thing up against the back, and if I wanted to, I could scribe lines against the beveled edges that are right down onto the material, so I'd get a really good line transfer. So this would actually be a good technique if you wanted to, say, batch these things out. These could be your template. So as long as you placed them the one way and then, you know, rotated them, of course, I would mark the back so you could just place it down right from the start. Line up the top edge, because the top edge, the bevel is going to be right up onto this edge, as you'll see. Now you can just go ahead and mark the lines. Now, in my case, I'm not going to use the mock-up parts to do the marking like this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do it using the triangle so that you can see how I did it in the first place when I did the mock-up. Now with the way I marked up these triangles, they all have numbers on them and they all indicate where they are. This one here says the rear facet, so that's what we're doing, and it's the rearmost angle. So that actually, if you were looking at this when it got unwrapped, the piece that was sitting here, the rearmost angle is this one here. This one here is as you're moving towards the front. So this is the rearmost angle. Uh, I have a really big negative sign on it to make sure I remember that what it is is all positive angles 
come into a board. In my program, at least, a positive angle is one where it's tipping down into the stock. So this is like the normal angle that you would have if you were making, say, a square bowl or a planter or anything like that. Or even if you're coopering something, that would be the size that you're normally going to be using. Positive angles are going to be where it tapers down to the bottom of the piece. So in the case of the negative, then that means it's not coming in like that, it's actually going the opposite direction. So now we can, of course, cheat and look at the mock-up, and you can see that that's what I mean by the negative angle. It's moving away. So we've got this at a negative, negative angle, so instead of it tapering down this way here, it's going to be going that direction. That's going to be the outside edge. So if I put this down to act like my fence, I place this on the side here so that the tape it butts up against this whole ruler and presses against it that's acting just like the fence that's on my crosscut sled. Well, now I've got this thing in the right position. Just uh, hold it in place and grab yourself a marking pencil. Just like that, got one side mark. So now we can take a look at the program and just see what its output is and the width of this piece. And of course, I'm going to cheat and verify over there. It's supposed to be 56.9 millimeters. So we'll just go for 57. So we'll go for 57. Burn 10 millimeters. Uh, for the Americans, the millimeters is the small scale. So now I need the other angle for the other side. So what I'm going to look for is I'm going to look for rear facet frontmost bevel. That would be this one here. This one here is not a negative angle, so I want it actually sloping into the inside. I want it tapering in. So that's actually this way here as well, starting from the mark that I made. This is the distance I care about. I'm only ever looking at the top reference surface. I don't care what the width is down here. That'll work itself out if I cut these things correctly. So line this thing up. There we go. That should be the left rear facet. I'll put this thing on since I can cheat and actually take a look and see. That's basically a perfect match. So I'm happy with that. So this is a good time for a little bit of veneer tape. This is just a water-based one, so this is just like licking a stamp. This isn't going to be like the high glue ones that you use for doing veneering. So now we're going to move to the side. Now I'm not going to go through all of them. I just wanted to show you this one here. You can see it's a, it's a bit of a tedious process. It's easy to do. You just put the ruler there, square up the board, mark the line. Uh, just be careful as you go. So take your time with it, and it worked out pretty easily when I did the MDF one. So now that's only for the miter cuts. We, the bevels are written on those, so when we go to do the actual cuts, we'll be adjusting the bevels. That has nothing to do with any marking at this point. So now for the width, I'm going to worry about that afterwards. First, I want to get the other two boards marked up. But for these other two boards, I'm actually just going to go ahead and use the MDF itself to mark it up so you can see the difference in speed. faster that can go. Remember that the triangles are going to set the angle for the miter. So when I put this thing on here, this board, I'm going to be looking down the line that I drew to make sure I've got it lined up with the saw plate. And basically all I got to do is scoot it side to side. I'm not actually pivoting it to make the angle match because that's already being set by the triangle. So it's very much so a guide. Now this last one has a different challenge for us. This is the one that's going to be for the top. And again, I'm planning on this box going up, and then it'll taper in just a little bit near the top. So there's a small section that we want to make sure we leave at the top. So in that sense, I'm not going to be using the very top of this board. I'm actually going to be using a line that I'm going to mark a little ways down from the top. So I'll be marking these pieces, say, right around there. And then this top part, we're going to end up marking and cutting later to match the piece when we go to put it together so that we can end up having a really nice top that's just going to taper in a little tiny bit to give it that real good diamond look. So the easiest thing for me to do is to just go ahead and rip it, then I can lay this out the exact same way I did the other boards. But one thing that's important to me is I do want to make sure that I have some registration marks on the two boards so that when I do the rip, I can later go and line these boards up for making cuts and I can get them lined up the same way they were before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a couple strips of veneer tape across here with a line. Now that's way more alignment lines than I'm going to need, but it's partly because the veneer tape I have tastes like burritos. Now all this sounds complicated, but all it is is just paying attention to all these things ahead of time. So I've put a lot of thought into it, especially when I'm down for 10 days because of a water softener. All these things are things that generally just work their way out 
in 90 degree work because you don't have to worry about it. 90 degrees, you don't have to compensate for extra on the thickness when you're doing cuts like this. It just plain works. So here you have to think of those extra items. So it's not really hard. It's just, just got to get that extra thought to it. So with all the lines in place, all the pieces labeled, now what I'm going to do is just take a jigsaw to basically cut between all these to separate the parts out. I don't need to be accurate to the line, just don't hit the line, because I'll be making those accurate cuts later with a cross-cut sled. So let's go! So now I've got three stacks of rough cut parts for these drawer sections. Now they've been marked for the miters, but they haven't been cut for the miters yet. That will be later that we'll be doing that. But there's still one step left that I need to do before I get to doing the miters. Now if you recall, each one of these drawer sections has a drawer. <laughs> Go figure. So we need to put a drawer in there. Now if you're trying to make an inset drawer front, normally you'll take the piece that's going to be the front of your, your drawer section, and you're going to actually cut the piece for the drawer front out of it. Now you don't actually you know, pierce a hole and go cutting around. I had to do that a little bit on my sculpted mahogany vanity, uh, but that was for a little bit of a different purpose. Now for this one here, I'm going to do it the traditional way, but we have to do it with a twist because of the way that everything is at an angle. So to review a bit, let me use the back of this piece of a mock-up. The way that you would normally remove, say, the middle part if you're doing an inset drawer, is you would take the stock before you do too much dimensioning, and you're going to rip it near the top. You would rip that part out. That would be where the top of the drawer is, but you rip it all the way across. Now, if it's actually going to be an inset drawer where there's a bottom as well, you would rip the bottom too, just like that. Now, this is going to be the part that's going to be on the front of the drawer. So what you would do is, after these are the three parts, now you would go ahead and you'd cut this square to remove what is your drawer front. Then after you've done that, you would reassemble these four outer parts to basically make the frame that goes around it. Now, there's the kerf is going to be nominally about an eighth of an inch, so by the time you clean that up a little bit, it might be a little bit bigger than an eighth of an inch, and you don't really want a gap that big around your drawer. So you're going to scoot this piece in, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, scoot this one in about a sixteenth of an inch, and then reassemble it. Now, there might be a little discrepancy in the grain up here or on these edges here where like some grain line is coming in like that because you're going to scoot it over just a little bit but it's going to be very, very difficult to see if you have a clean glue joint. So that's normally how you do it if you're trying to do an inset drawer. Now, in my case, the drawer isn't going to be just a drawer like this where there's a piece of stock on the bottom and on the top. It's only going to be a piece on the top. This bottom is going to continue all the way down because I'm going to use the bottom of the drawer, the bottom edge, as a lip for you to open the drawer. So for me, this bottom line wouldn't exist. But there's a catch when we go to do this build. The problem is that it's inclined. This is the front. Now this is the actual front of the mock-up. So if you take a look, and I put this thing square, you can see that it's, it's inclined towards me. Now it's not going to be too visible on the camera, so let me angle it more. Now if I went over here and I did a straight cut, that's a, a straight cut. So if I were to just put this on the table saw and do the rip to do this part here, this is where the cut line is going to be. But watch what happens when I take this and I lean it forward. You can see now that it's actually angling up. So the problem is if I were to cut that out without paying attention ahead of time, then I would have a drawer that when I assemble the drawer, I couldn't actually push it in because the back of it is sticking up higher than the opening is in the front. So the way to correct this is that I would have to, for the incline of this drawer, so say if this drawer front was inclined this much, so it wants to match the bevel that's on the top and the bottom. It's got to be parallel to that. Now the drawer can be inserted in and out. Now that only affects this rip cut that we have here on the top. These side cuts here, uh, mine aren't going to be square, they're going to be parallel to the outside edge. But this rip cut up here is the only one that's going to have a bevel associated with it, and it's going to be the same bevel if we want it to be 
if we want it to be square looking after assembly, it's going to match the bevel that's on the top and bottom. But one thing I don't like about the idea of making it on exactly that bevel means is that this is an entertainment center, so, you know, if the camera is the TV, basically I'm sitting here staring straight at it. And if that cut is cut so that it's exactly horizontal, you know, to, to the floor, I'm basically looking right into that crack the whole time. That's normally the case if you had like a nightstand or a small dresser where you did an inset drawer. If you're sitting right in front of it, you're going to be looking straight down into the crack of that, that opening. So now on a nightstand, you're generally not sitting there, unless you had a really rough night at the club before. But in the case of this entertainment center, I'm absolutely positively going to be right in front of it. So what I'm going to do instead is, instead of cutting this at this angle here, I'm actually going to make it a little bit more. So what's going to happen is that the drawer is still going to be exaggerating. It's going to be shaped like this so that it can actually get into the opening. But I'm making it so that the opening is tilted down like this, right? So the drawer is going to come and it's going to hit the back like that. I'm greatly exaggerating. It's only going to be tilted down a few extra degrees. But this way here, when I'm looking in, when my what I see when I look into the crack is I'm going to see part of the slope that's in the back. It's going to be the same maple. So it's going to greatly hide that opening. And it's not going to affect the way the drawer opens and closes. With that idea in mind, I am also going to do that on these side pieces. When I do these side cuts, I'm going to, if this was the front, I'm going to angle it in like this on both sides. So that when you're looking straight on, you're going to see just a little ways in, and then you're going to see the exact same maple. So what does that mean right now? That means i got to go to the bandsaw to make this rip. I want to use the bandsaw because the bandsaw has got a very small kerf compared to my table saw and it's a very clean cutting saw so I'm not going to have any problems with doing the glue up afterwards. But then we're going to temporarily reattach the bottom to the top part so that then when I go and I cut these miters on there, they're going to be smooth and continuous. So that when I later take these parts here and I do the cuts for the drawer and all that, that's all fine. These miters aren't going to be affected. So I've marked the boards with the 7 eighths of an inch strip that I'm going to be keeping on here, kind of calculating with the idea of there's going to be you know, a quarter inch piece of uh, Medex for the top panel that's going to be veneered, and then there's going to be a little bit of structural support underneath. I'm thinking that the 7 eighths is going to work just fine. So I've marked that here, and I've also marked on the side a line that's angled the direction that I need to make sure this bevel cut is going. Uh, it's exaggerated, and I don't really care because this is going to get cut off anyway. But this way here I can help make sure I keep everything in the right angles in perspective. Now, the way that this is going to work, because of this angle, the problem is that uh, this is the top surface, the, the front show face. For me to do this cut this way, I actually have to put it down. So I really need a zero clearance insert. Now, I remove the insert on this one here. It's the stock insert. It's a little bit thick right here in the middle. And when you put the blade on an angle like this, you'll find that it really fights the insert. And it really... Uh, crumbles. <laughs> so I don't like to leave it in there when I'm doing a cut like this. So the question is, how am I going to get myself a nice zero clearance insert? So I've got myself a piece of scrap MDF that I use actually as a sacrificial surface almost all the time. I'm going to put it on top of here so I can get the correct spacing and I'm going to figure out where I can put this fence in order to get this cut. Now the reason I need to put this piece of sacrificial wood here. I'm going to be using this as a zero clearance insert, and you'll see that in just a moment. But I need to have this here because it actually affects where this angle, where the blade is going to be. If I tried to line this up without the piece in the way, it's actually going to move it when I lift it up. So it needs to be in place while I'm doing the alignment. So I'm not going to hold this board like here and try pushing this in. I really want to have, I really want to have this thing held in place. So what I did is I just bored a 40 millimeter hole in it because I have some, my magnetic feather board has these inserts and the inserts basically are 40 millimeters in diameter. So I have one of those ready to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push this thing through the blade till it pops out to about here and then I'm going to use the magnet to lock it into place. And then that's going to hold this here. Then I can go ahead and just run the board like usual up against the fence. Uh, there's no way I can use a magnetic feather board so I'll just push it up against the fence to make sure I get good registration and make the cut. about this blade is if you keep it moving steady there's not a single bit of bandsaw mark on there so if you really wanted to clean that up to make 
a glue joint absolutely perfect. It would just take a little swipe with something like a 180 grit paper on a stiff block just to make sure you finesse off any lines. Now the front to me is looking just perfect. There's no tear out at all on the front. Uh, this is actually not going to be a joint, but there's going to be joints on the outside edges, so we do care about it over there. Okay, let's go do the other boards. So now that I have all these drawer fronts already ripped and they have the nice bevel on them, I'm really happy with the quality of the cut. I can squeeze this and it completely disappears. So as long as I do a decent job clamping this up when I glue it, I should be just fine. But the thing is, I need to, I can't cut the miters when I've got these things cut. The reason why I had to cut these ahead of time is, well, partly you kind of need to, <laughs> just with the whole assembly when you start to think of it later, but also I need these things reattached now so that I can cut these miters and then they're going to be nice and continuous. They're going to be very smooth. Had I done the miters first, then done the rip, the problem with the kerf is that as that little loss of a kerf, no matter how small that loss is going to be, when it then goes back together, you would have a step here. The bottom part being wider than it needs to be in the case of the front where it tapers down on both sides. So you would have a step. So that's why I needed it ripped first and I need it reassembled so that when I make that miter cut, it's going to be smooth. Now I need it held together. I could put it together maybe with some temporary glue, but that's going to be a little bit tricky because then how do I bust it apart without busting it apart? So what I'm going to do is I want to put a domino here and on this outside edge because when I put the drawers and I cut the drawers, I'm going to be cutting this front piece about out here. So I'm going to leave a pretty good chunk of meat on the side and then the drawer will be cut out of the other part. So there's going to be room here for a domino that can be used to attach it to this other piece. Now of course nothing can be easy because of these silly angles. So now I've got an angled piece here and an angled piece here that I need to join together with the domino. So how are we going to do it? Now I actually have Domizilla here. Um, I was only joking about sending him to California. He's actually manning the camera right now. But this is actually a job that's going to be a little easier to do with the 500. You could do it with Domizilla, but this one's just going to be a little bit easier and you're going to see how. Now the flat area on the side is going to be about an inch and a half wide. So I have plenty of room for a domino. Now what I'm going to use is I'm going to use a 530 domino. So it's 5 millimeter domino, 30 millimeters long. And then we're going to put it in both sides in order to attach the top to the part that's you know, the side that's going to be remaining as part of the solid part of the cabinet, and then this part here will eventually be cut out. So there's just enough room there. But you got to remember, we have to be cautious because this top part is going to get a bevel cut on it, so we actually need to scoot this down just a little bit. There's a couple things to follow on this. The way that I'm going to do this domino mortise is I'm going to use the bottom of the domino as a reference surface, so it's going to be flat on the bench. That puts the domino centered 10 millimeters up from the bottom surface. This happens to be, uh, and this is just total luck, it's 20 millimeters thick. Now, I don't care about it being dead center, I just want it close to center. I don't really want it too close to the surface or, or too far down. I kind of would like it sort of in the middle, and this is going to work out just perfectly. So the way that I'm going to do it is I'm going to leave the domino flat on the bench, leave the stock flat on the bench, and then just push it up against it and mortise the hole. The catch is, that these have a bevel. So if we were to look at this top piece because it'll be more visible, you can see that when I push this up against it and it registers against the wood, there's a gap. Our gap is four millimeters. So that means the depth of this mortise is gonna be whatever I said on here, minus four millimeters, just because there's this open space before we hit the stock. So the way that we're gonna do this, so now pay attention to the miter line. That's the one that we wanna get as close to dead on as possible on both sides. Even though there's a little bit of a kerf gap, this kerf is very small. It's a very small bandsaw blade, but you're going to feel the kerf here. On both sides, you're going to feel a little tiny ledge that's the kerf. So just try centering that off. It doesn't matter because once we assemble this and we make the cut, then 
it matters. So I'm going to put the domino here, right around there. Now, remember that I can't put it 50-50, so 15 and 15, because I'm going to be risking when I put the bevel cut on this side of the board that I'm going to expose it. And that would be horrible, because this is a show side. This is the top of the box. So I want to push it down a little bit lower. It's fine that it's down deeper into there. This is only being used for alignment. Really what I want is the long grain to long grain glue up here. There we go, a reconstituted board. So these top points where the line intersects the top, that marks where the miter is supposed to start. I'm going to be taking the combination square and the triangles to remark this entire miter on the sides to take into account the fact that there's, you know, that this was realigned after the fact. So that one's going to glue up really nicely, but we're not going to be gluing it up yet. What this is for is this is just to reconstitute it so that we can put the miter on there and we can cut that compound angle. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to leave the dominoes in there. Those are to hold it and keep it nice and secured. I'm going to put a strip of packing tape all the way along here to make sure that this thing stays together nice and tight. There's no bowing. It's not going to affect anything when we go to do the cuts, but just to make sure that this stays exactly in place. Then later on, when we get further along and we need to actually cut the drawer parts out, then we're going to separate that cut the parts, and then we're going to glue it back in. But we're going to have a very clean miter cut there so we can use that for the alignment. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put the mortises in the rest of them. So at this point, I've got all the drawer fronts all taped up, marked up, dominoed. So they're all ready to go onto the crosscut sled for some final dimensioning. Now these parts here, they've all been rough cut. They're all ready to go as well onto the crosscut sled. But I have a feeling that this episode is already a little bit too long. So I'm going to cut it here. And the next time we're going to take the crosscut sled to get the final dimensioning of all this stock down to the compound angles and everything so that we can domino it together and uh, assemble it. So you'll get the chance to see how the domino works in compound angles as well. So we'll do that next time. Thanks. Whose idea was it to do all these angles?